Thank you for watching Concord United on YouTube. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest videos. If you'd like to learn more about our church, please visit our website at concordunited.org. We hope you will take advantage of our many opportunities to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. I want to just say a word about Holy Communion. Uh, we're going to be four stations, four, and, and they'll be here, 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 and here. So come to the station that seems to be nearest to you. You can come on your own. You're not going to be escorted by a... By a uh, uh, an usher. And what will happen is you will receive a piece of bread. We will tear a piece of bread. And if you'll just hold your hands like this, we'll drop it into your hands. The person serving the bread will have sanitized their hands. And then a gloved hand will give you a little cup of juice. And there are some little trash cans that you can toss your uh, little juice cup in as you leave. Um, this is not my table or Will's table. It's not a United Methodist table. This is the Lord's table. Now, remember that everybody's invited. You don't have to be a member of this church or any church to come and receive the grace that Jesus offers at his table, okay? Now, I'm going to start with a question. Was that a real slap or was that like WWE? <laughs> I mean, really, was that a work? Was, was that a work? I think they could call it a work in WWE, you know, where they're trying to get you to think something. I mean, I don't know why Will Smith and Chris Rock would, would you know, collaborate to do something like that. And I guess, I guess we'll never know exactly. But in my opinion, and I'm a Will Smith fan, especially, you know, I haven't seen a lot of his movies, but I love Men in Black, and we watch it about once a year just because we love that movie. And he's a great, he's a great hero in his character. But if what happened at the Academy Awards was truly his character... I'm not so sure. Now, now, we certainly want to defend the honor of our family, and I get that. I get that. I don't know that that's the way you do it on national television to serve as an example to all these people watching, particularly young people, to, wall, to haul off and slap somebody because they made a joke about your wife, uh, who's a very high-profile person. It was a, it was a, the joke was in bad taste, but I'm not sure that's the response. In fact, for me, I'm sure it's not the response. And as much as the slap, it was the language that he used. And I'm not a prude. I've said that word before. You know, many of us have. Um, but it's not the kind of word I would have ever said in front of my mother. But he, and I don't know that he would have said it in front of his mother. But he said it in front of hundreds of thousands of moms on national television. That's not what heroes do. And it made me think about the difference between the character of a hero, the, their character that they play, his role in Men in Black, which is hilarious. I love that. And he's played lots of heroes. And I think about our sports heroes, and we see one side of them. We see them with their helmets on, or we see them with their basketball clothes on, or their baseball uniforms, or whatever it may be. We see that. But we find out too often that that's not who they really are. That's their character. But it's not their real character. And what we want to talk about this morning is, as we talk about a real ID, is developing, is developing a character that is modeled after the greatest hero the universe will ever know. Jesus the Christ. Uh, he was our hero. And he wants to develop that character in you and me. We can trust his character. We can trust that he will be who he says he is. And he wants us to be able to live that out in the world on his behalf that others can see. I was thinking about an acronym for hero. And you know, for the once for Will Smith, and, and I'm not picking on Will Smith, okay? Everybody has a bad day. That was a, re that was a really, really bad day, in my opinion. But, but you know, you think, about, you think about these celebrities, and you think about an acronym for hero. Headlines. You know, ego. Um, recognition. Overbearing. That's what we see in a lot of our celebrity heroes. But that's not what we see in Jesus. In fact, let me describe for you what we see in Jesus. This is from Philippians. Philippians is a letter that Paul, the apostle, we're working through his letters uh, in our sermon series right now, Real ID. 
This is a letter he wrote to the church at Philippi, um, which is over there in, in the vicinity of Turkey, uh, has been there for a long, 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 long time. And the church at Philippi uh, w- loved Paul. Not all the churches did. He had sort of a love-hate relationship with some of them. He founded them. He helped them. He taught them, mentored them. But a lot of them didn't like Paul. Philipp- Philippians did. And so he was writing them. Uh, to share these insights about Jesus and how they were to form their character in honor of him, the ultimate hero. And listen to what it says, chapter 2 from Philippians. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, in other words, if this Jesus, if you realize all he's done for you, then... Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It doesn't sound like our celebrity heroes, does it? Rather, he made himself nothing. That really doesn't sound like our celebrity heroes. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And that good purpose is to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourself, to live as Jesus lived, not for our selfish ambitions and desires, but for others. So I have a new acronym. Uh, in, instead of headlines, ego recognition and overbearing, which so many of our, our uh, celebrity heroes live by, how about this one? How about humility, empathy, relationships, and nobody likes this one, but it's key, obedience. Let's explore those for just a minute or two before we come to this table. Let's first, let's talk about humility. I mean, Paul's pretty clear. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And this is tricky because we're... (laughs) especially with celebrities and, and, and sports celebrities, you know, we hear a lot about they got, they got this swagger, you know. And I know that confidence is important. And I know that, that some defensive back doesn't want to line up against the best wide receiver on the field and not feel confident that they can cover him. You know, uh, athletes have to have confidence in themselves. And but, but sometimes there's a little too much swagger and there's a little too much self-love, and sometimes that, that doesn't play well. And, and they have to remember that, that, you know, young people are watching them, and not just their skills, but what they do. And we're seeing it played out. Did you see the awful video? It was all over YouTube. I think it's been viewed millions of times where the high school teams were playing, and as they're in the handshake line with the opposing team, one of the players sucker punched another one of the players and knocked him out. You know, I'm not saying that's because that's what they see on TV, but I'm just saying that's sometimes what they see on TV. And that's not who God is calling us to be. That is not humility. Humility doesn't mean, by the way, deciding that others are better. It means deciding others are more important. We're not called, we're not called to be a doormat. We're not called to be on the receiving end of abuse by others. That is not what I mean by humility. What I do mean is that we decide that because Jesus humbled himself for us, 
that we could humble ourselves for somebody else and we could just make a decision that I'm going to treat this person as if they're more important than me right now. And I'm going to let them have the upper hand. I'm going, to, I'm going to let them have the biggest piece of pie, you know. I'll let them have the last cup of coffee. I'll do whatever I can for them. Humility, it's, it's beautiful, and we don't see all that much of it, but it's a part of being a hero in the likeness of Jesus because heaven knows he was humble for us. And then there's empathy. In verse 4, it says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you the interests of the others. And empathy gets confused. It's, it's not just feeling sorry. That, that's, that's not what it's about. It's about actually identifying with and sharing other people's burdens. I, just a quick example of two or three years ago, whenever Lynn, my wife, was just going through a really hard time, um, I had people would would want to stop me in the hallway and say something they thought would be affirming and helpful. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. I know they always meant well. But the thing that I will never forget is that one of our church members came into my office one day, knocked on the door and said, if you have a minute? And I said, yeah. And that was all they said to me. They walked in and pulled a chair up next to where I was sitting behind my laptop in my office behind my desk. And they just started crying. And it was almost like it gave me permission because, you know, whenever things are going, going on and you, you want to be stoic and I've got to, I've got to keep going, I've got to do my job and got to be there for these people and all this stuff. And what I really needed to do was just lose it. And this person came in and sat with me and just started crying. And I started crying. And we just sat there and sobbed together for about five minutes. And it made all the difference in the world. And that person then was truly being empathetic in that that person was willing to identify with my trouble and sit with me in that for a brief season. Empathy isn't feeling sorry for others. It's feeling others' sorrow. Jesus in Isaiah, the, the suffering servant as he's called in Isaiah, uh, the Messiah as Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah who was coming that we now know as Jesus. He was, called, he was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with so much trouble. And we have a song, there's an old hymn, Man of Sorrows. Well, whose sorrows were those? They weren't his. They weren't Jesus' sorrows. This man of sorrows, he took on Ours. And because of his empathy, we could understand that there was someone now knowing that he was Jesus, he was God Almighty, was willing to come and sit with us for a season and help us understand how much he cared. So there's humility and there's empathy, and it's so important. And it all happens in the context of relationships. Paul is very explicit about that. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. What was Christ's mindset? To leave his station, to leave his place on the throne room in heaven, and to come to this earth to be here to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, to be in relationship with us so that we might have this relationship with him that would change everything. That's what he did. That's what we're supposed to do, to be the hero in our relationships. I mean, Jesus didn't sit up on a throne in front of the temple inviting people to come and let him heal them. He went out and walked and went places where Jewish men didn't go, into Samaria. That's bad, that's bad territory. You didn't do that, but he did because there was somebody there you need to talk to, that woman at the well. Go back and read that story from John. Uh, it's beautiful. This woman who had had several failed relationships and Jesus said, that's the one I want to go see. And he sat down with her and he talked to her. And in the context of this relationship he developed with her, he gave her a new vision of, what, of who Messiah is, of what salvation could be, and what the rest of her life could be. It's very beautiful. It happens in relationship. The hero of any relationship is the one who maintains the other's dignity. In all of these relationships that Jesus had, he never dressed anybody down. He never upbraided somebody. He never put them down and made them feel bad. He created a relationship with them and then let them come to their own realization of what they needed to do next. He treated them, he treated them 
not even his equals, he elevated them. He was the hero of those relationships because he put them first, put himself second. So there's humility, there's empathy, there's relationships if we want to be a hero in the model of Jesus. And then there's one more. And this is the one everybody goes, yeah, I don't know, preacher. I think you may be meddling now. And that's obedience. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we are not called, we are not called to go die for somebody. We are not called to put ourselves in harm's way for somebody. We're not called to allow people to abuse us. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that Jesus, the incarnate God of all creation, in his relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit, remember the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they had a plan. He would come and take the form of a man, and he was obedient to that plan all the way to the end. For you and me. And there is this word that we hear in seminary that, that, that talks about when, when Jesus was at his weakest moment, that's when he was most powerful. When he had hung on that cross, had emptied himself of everything that was him, his blood, his sweat, literally his tears, everything he had, he was drained on that cross. But in the moment that he was emptied for us, he was filled with the power of resurrection and salvation to share with everyone because of his obedience. And the same thing happens with you and me. When we allow ourselves to be emptied of that need for headlines and that need for recognition and the need to, to feed our ego and all that, which we, we're humans, we all have that. And I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. I got that, okay? But it doesn't have to be that way. When we're willing to empty ourselves of that, then we can allow ourselves to be filled with everything Jesus wants us to be filled with. And that's why I will tell you that obedience to Christ's command to love, obedience to Christ's demand to love is our superpower. And every hero has a superpower. And that's ours. It begins with obedience. We just empty ourselves of all of this stuff that we think we need, all of this, all of this uh, self-aggrandizement, um, all of this... Whatever it is, and I know that's hard for some because we all come with baggage. But I'm saying that Jesus, we can trust him. We can trust our vulnerability to Jesus because he will never take advantage of it. If you walk up to Jesus, or I will say, if you get on your knees before Jesus and go, Jesus, I'm done, I'm sunk, I'm empty, I'm drained, I have nothing else. He will never take advantage of that. He will just say, well, then let me, let me give you what I have. And that's how he's the hero in our relationship. And we can be a hero in the relationships we have with others by simply being obedient to Christ's call. And that becomes then our superpower. And people understand we really care about them. We don't want anything from them. We just want them to have what we have. And it's so powerful.